We want to remind our listeners that this program is for informational and educational purposes only and not intended to substitute for professional veterinary medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The Animal Medical Center does not recommend or endorse any products or services advertised by SiriusXM. Welcome to Ask the Vet with Dr. Ann Hohenhaus. This is the place to talk about your pets and get advice with a top veterinarian from the Animal Medical Center in NYC. Hear from the leading authorities on animals and ask your questions. Now, here's your host, Dr. Ann Hohenhaus. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Ask the Vet podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Ann Hohenhaus. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm a board certified specialist in both veterinary internal medicine and oncology. And I'm a senior veterinarian at the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center here in New York City. AMC is the largest not-for-profit animal hospital in the world. I'm so glad you tuned in today because we have got a great show. First, I'll be talking with my friend, Jill Rappaport. She's a passionate animal advocate, especially for senior pets, PDs, and those with special needs. Then we'll be talking about her recent foster experience and her commitment to animal welfare and a new line of leashes and collars that gives back to animal advocacy work. I'm so looking forward to our conversation and I hope you'll stay tuned. Thanks to the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center's longtime partnership with Sirius XM Radio, the Ask the Vet podcast is available on all major podcast platforms, as well as on the Sirius XM app. I hope you'll take a minute to like and follow us to stay current on timely and important pet health news. You know, the Animal Medical Center provides the absolute best care for pets for the past 113 years. And the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center keeps families together that way by keeping your pet healthy and keeping your pet at home with you. Now, later in the show, I'm going to answer questions about your pet's health that people have emailed in. And if you have an email question that you'd like me to answer about your pet or any animal question, then I'll answer on next month's show if you just email us. I'll give it now and I'll give it later on in the show in case you don't have a pen or pencil, but it's pretty easy to remember. The email address is askthevet, one big word, at amcny.org. Again, askthevet at amcny.org. It's time for the Internet's most talked about animal. So our trending animal for today is Bailey. Bailey is a newly adopted dog from Texas's Animal Rescue League of El Paso. And Bailey went missing from her new home. Her pet parents immediately contacted the shelter who posted about it on social media. And before long, there were reports of Bailey being sighted. But to everyone's surprise, Bailey somehow didn't go home. She went back to the shelter. But there's more. The facility has a ring camera and actually captured Bailey ringing their doorbell, looking as if she wanted in and needed help. The staff rushed to the shelter and put Bailey in her run. Rescue League of El Paso founder Lorette Hyde said she was amazed that Bailey found her way back to the shelter because it wasn't just around the corner. It was 10 miles away. She said dogs are smarter than people. Give them credit for that. How did she know what direction to go? Happily, Bailey is settling back in with her forever family. And if you want to see Bailey ringing the doorbell at the El Paso Rescue League, this Google Bailey rings the shelter's doorbell to see the actual video. And now I'm so delighted to welcome my guest for today, um, my dear friend, Jill Rappaport. And Jill, you'll have to tell me how long we've known each other, but it I, I sort of don't remember not knowing you. It's what happens in the exactly. animal world. Exactly. Well, first of all, Anne, I'm honored to be on your wonderful show. And your listeners should just understand that you exemplify what a wonderful, heartfelt, compassionate vet should be and is. Uh, Anne and I, you know, we met decades ago, sadly, when one of my dogs had a terrible, I believe it was adenocarcinoma, um, and had his leg amputated, uh, which you and I know should not have happened in that situation. And you were there for me for the heartbreak, for just as a shoulder to cry on. 
Uh, and I have always had the utmost respect for you, not only for your brilliance and your knowledge, but your compassion and your care. And I think that that is so important because, you know, I don't have human children, but my pets have always been my children. And when you can have a vet like yourself a that understands loss and it, it, what it's like to go through and watch a animal go through undue pain due to bad decisions or whatever. I mean, you got me through that, Anne, and I will forever be grateful to you, uh, you know, for all the decades. Oh, I've known that, you. that is so amazing. kind. And I didn't do this on purpose, but the blog uh, at the AMC blog that posted today is actually about amputation in pets. And it, it celebrates two things. If you can even think that celebrating an amputation is what might be done, it wow. celebrates pets with amputations and the people that take care of them. And so this blog... And you and not to interrupt you, but my second dog that had to undergo, because of osteosarcoma, a, a leg amputation, Jack is the dog, my German shepherd that changed my life. Not only did that amputation save his life, he survived and lived three and a half years. Uh, he had it at 11. He was almost 13 when he passed. And you know, for a German shepherd, without any health issues, 13 is a miracle. I wrote the book, Jack and Jill, a uh, happy dog with a miracle tail, T-A-I-L to tell, which is still in schools across the country. Jack changed my career. I was the entertainment reporter on the Today Show until Jack's story, which we featured on the Today Show, showing people about compassion and loss of a limb, never let this German shepherd living the best day and the best life he could ever have and what we can learn from our animals. They just want to be out of pain and love. They don't care what they look like. They just want you to love them and not feel pain. So my dog, the second dog's amputation changed my life forever and allowed him to live out his life. So this is very fortuitous that I'm on today and that this a date is this week because I have been through so much with amputation that really left an indelible mark on me. The first one was very unfortunate, as you know, Anne, and the second one was life changing. Well, and you know, the the Jack and Jill book is only one of four books that Jill Rappaport has written. Um, I happen to have a copy of this one, which is uh, The People We Know, The Horses That We Love, which are beautiful <laughs> photographs of uh, My sister people and those. horses. Thank you. You know, and I also wrote a book about cats and, and cat rescue. Uh, again, you know, my life, and, and you've known this, uh, rescue and adoption are my oxygen. And it is, is my goal in life to try everybody I meet to try to educate them to the joys and the importance of giving a second chance for a beautiful animal to, you know, be rescued and get a new home and a new life. So well, I so, appreciate you know, this Jill opportunity. Jill also has a podcast called Rappaport to the Rescue on Pet Life Radio. And it says here in my notes that it is the number one pet podcast and reaches 20 million customers. Is that really true? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what they tell me. But you know, it's funny. Um, it, it, it's a, it, so much of it is celebrity based. And I love to have guests on celebrities that um, literally have been rescued by their rescues. Um, that's kind of the message. Every interview I do is all about rescuing and how these famous people with their big, exciting, busy lives were totally changed and their lives were enhanced thanks to their rescue. And the stories are, and they're incredible, like what these people went through, never even rescuing before. Some of these celebrities never even had animals. And when they opened their heart and home to a rescue pet, their whole life just got that much better and it helped with their career their marriages everything <laughs> so what's the best story then from uh, Rappaport to the rescue what's your favorite one well I I have so many um one of my closest friends is uh Christy Brinkley and I got her her rescue dog and Chester has literally been as I call her Chester her fourth child and she talked about how Chester made such a difference in her life during COVID because her kids were there too, but there was something about having him. He never left her side. It's as if he knew there was a pandemic and whatever she was going through, whatever fear she had, there was always Chester there with those sweet, wonderful eyes to make her feel never alone. And, and you know, your kids come and go and, and everything was so crazy. And when you have young kids, you know, they're frustrated. They can't go out. They can't see their friends. But Chester was like the calming force. 
And, um, you know, we interviewed Tina Fey about her new rescue for her daughters and what their dog has done, you know, to make her daughters, you know, better people. Everybody has an amazing story, you know, and Emmy Lou Harris, you know, we interviewed her and she wrote a story about Big Black Dog, it's called, is the song. And you know, Anne, about big black dogs and black dogs in general. It's called Black Dog Syndrome. And they're almost as hard to get adopted as pit bulls. And Emmy Lou is so passionate about it. And she was the one that told me about it. I never even knew about Black Dog Syndrome. She's actually written a song about it. And she sang it on my podcast. Oh, and how fun. It, it was now, so great. For for the listeners out there, if, if you haven't figured out, Jill is like really... a a huge passionate proponent of animal rescue and it has not gone unnoticed for um she's won the first voice for animals award from the humane society of the united states and she's won a total of seven genesis awards from the same organization which are considered the oscars of the animal world Uh, and probably it's a party where you got a sparkly dress on with like tufts of animal hair hanging off of it then she won the (laughs) presidential service award for media excellence from the aspca and the excellence in journalism and outstanding contributions to the pet industry award so i mean you guys can't see her, but this woman has got uh, trophies that you can't even begin to imagine. Oh, thank you, Anne. You know, but I'll tell you, the, the real win is knowing that hopefully I've had a hand in saving countless lives. Because I'm telling you, when, when Jack's story happened and I was doing celebrities, you know, I was on the red carpet. And I'll never forget going into my boss's office that day when we chronicled Jack's story. It was his last treatment of the chemotherapy. And this was many, many years ago. And it began with a C, you'll know the name, but it was the strongest chemotherapy. And I remember them telling me, Jerry Post, you know, Jerry, Oh yeah. he said, listen, I know, I know you're going to be filming this, but just understand Jack has one leg left in the front. And if one drop gets on that leg or he moves, you, you could be looking at another amputation. You can imagine the fear. And, and I was like, oh, I said to the camera crew, don't do anything. Be, be very careful. Walk gingerly. And so we were filming Jack's last treatment and it resonated all over the world. And that's when I went to my boss and said, stars don't need my help. Animals do. And I literally that day went from the red carpet to the wee wee pad. And he wanted to call me Joe <laughs> Rappaport today shows pet reporter. And I said, oh, no, no, no. I'm animal advocate. Pet reporter is way too fluffy from what I'm going to be doing. And I started Bow to Wow, which um, was the first national rescue segment on TV in eight years. And I'm talking all sorts of dogs, you know, deaf, blind, three legs, senior. We had a 100 percent adoption record. I then covered uh, a terrible story, the horse racing industry story, where there was a man upstate New York. They once they were not good enough to be on the track anymore. He left them on a farm in Climax, New York, and they were living on rainwater and wood to survive. And we Ugh. rescued 68 horses. We saved them. And, um, you know, again, it's, it's not just the four dogs I had every month up for adoption, which were immediately like the phones were ringing off the hook and the emails. It's the message that went out all across the country that this is what you need to be doing. <laughs> you know, it, it, you know, okay. And I, my biggest frustration, Anna, and I know, Everybody goes through this, but the biggest thing that people would say to me is, you can't find what I want in rescue. And I'm saying, really? What do you want? Because there's German Shepherd Rescue, there's Golden Retriever Rescue, there's Dachshund Rescue. Tell me what you want and tell me that I can't find it for you. So there's no excuse not to adopt. And what's going on right now, which is so heartbreaking, I just fostered a golden doodle and the sister was a standard poodle of apricot, the rarest. These are the designer dogs that are an influx that are literally languishing in shelters nationwide. The designer dogs now, because everybody, what happened during COVID, everybody wanted a dog. Well, guess what? Many have been returned. So now all these fancy schmancy rest, you know, designer dogs are filling up our, sh- our shelters. What do you think that does for the special needs and the seniors and the bully breeds yeah. who had the most difficult time before? It, it is so heartbreaking to me that, I, you know, I, I don't sleep thinking about this. And it's, it's, it, it consumes my life because I know 
that when you open up your heart and home to one of these dogs, it's the person that benefits. I'm not kidding you. It's the best gift you can give yourself. So talk a little bit about um, the fosters that you have right now. But first, I'll talk about my fosters. My fosters are oh, named... Oh, yes. I want to hear all about that, Anne. They're named Sushi and Sashimi. Uh, they're five <laughs> weeks old. Um, and if you can guess from their name that they're kittens. And I of got course. them when their umbilical cords were still attached to them. So they were only a couple days old. And... They are little tigers and uh, Sashimi already has an adopter. So that's, that's good. I'm, I'm halfway there with them. And Sushi and Sashimi are about my 94th, 90, 93rd, 94th cats, I think, since, um, since I started doing this when my son was in junior high and he can't have a cat because he's allergic, but he really wanted a cat. So this was our way of having cats without having cats kind of thing. And then I kind of got right. hooked and kept doing it um, because not everyone wants to bottle feed kittens. Um, and I'm lucky in that, you know, they go to the office with me and, um, and then we put them on a kitten cam uh, when I'm working so that people can Aww. see the kittens playing with their pipe. These two love pipe cleaners. Oh, absolutely adore <laughs> pipe cleaners. They don't care about balls. They don't really care about the scratching thing, but the pipe cleaners are really big. So what have you got? It's hilarious. Well, first of all, I want to commend you because in rescue, cats and kittens are just an overabundance. I believe it's like five cats and three kittens to every one dog and, and you know, puppies never seem to have an issue. So the kitten and cat situation is dire absolutely dire. And I have found because, you know, the old expression foster fail and people laugh about it. Oh, I'm a foster fail. I fostered the dog. I ended up keeping it for the first time. I've always had six dogs during COVID. I lost three, which was so horrific and in horrific ways, you know, it's just, and it's never the right time. The only one dog that she lived till 21, my CJ, and she had a heart attack and we treated her for six months. And then she went up the stairs and fell to the side. And, and But I say to myself now, if every one of my dogs can get 21 years and go that way without cancer or any other serious health issue in their life, I'll buy it. I'll take it right now. Was but CJ I, I, the so Maltese? All, CJ was the Havanese that Dawn used to remember she had Dawn yeah. knew her and she was, and we know she's 21 because I rescued her from a family fifth Avenue. The kids were very kind of mean to her and we got her at two years old. So we knew her age and, and literally we had her 19 years, which is unbelievable for a dog. Okay. So, but, and my other American bulldog, 120 pounds, he lived till 16 and a half. He had a pretty aggressive cancer at the end, but 16 and a half, not you bad. know, American Bulldogs are life expectancy is 12, you know. So, so for, for listeners decided, out there, I just want to be sure that you know what American Bulldog is because right, right. Uh, Frenchies are kind of a small, compact Bulldog. Then we've got the English the, Bulldog, the ears that stick which is, yeah. is the classic stocky, broad Bulldog. It's like a 60-pound right. dog with stumpy legs. And then American yeah. Bulldog is actually fairly easy for people to confuse with a pit bull, but it's, it's, it's a different deal. Um, it's not right. the same thing. So it's a long-legged Bulldog as opposed to the short pounds with, Yeah, with huge head. I mean, yes. his head was the size of a basketball. And here, the, here is the thing, as Matt Bershacker, the wonderful CEO of the ASPCA, pointed out to me, there is no such thing as bully breeds. It's a slang term. Uh, what people always say, you know, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, not bully breeds, pit bulls. That is a slang term. It, it's pit. What they are is bully breeds. So the people that are seeing these pictures and hear these horrible stories of, you know, all these pit bull attacks and they say, oh, pit bulls, pit bulls. You know, many times, you know, they're looking at Staffordshires, you know, it, it, it can be uh, there's the bully breed family has all sorts of dogs under that, you know, genre and American bulldog, English bulldog. Frenchie Bulldog, Staffordshire Mix, you know, they're all under there, but there is no such thing as a pit bull. Okay. The classic pit bull doesn't really exist according and Matt confirmed that to me, but we hear the horrible stories and there is a thing called pit bull prejudice and Petey 
people were terrified when they looked at him because even though he's an American bulldog, which is not a recognized breed, like Westminster doesn't even recognize that as a quote breed. Um, he has a, what people perceive as a pit bull face. He was very big, very massive. Meanwhile, he was the kindest, sweetest dog I ever had. And I have been working my whole life to try to educate people that it's not the dog, <laughs> you know, it, it, just like human beings, they're good people, they're bad people. And pit bulls have been getting because of the press. And listen, I'm not saying those situations didn't occur and they're horrific. Don't get me wrong. But that does not make every bully breed bad. And it's a problem because that is what is sitting in our shelters. 90% are bully breeds waiting to die, you know, and many do because their time has run out and no one will adopt them. So I tell people all the time, you have to do your homework, you have to do your due diligence, but just don't walk past a cage because you've seen a face in the news and then that's a bad dog because that's not true. And Anne, you know that, am I right? Well, absolutely. The American Veterinary Medical Association really is not in favor of breed bans, shall we say, because it, right. it get you know, it bans some incredibly lovely dogs. Um, and exactly. so I think that th there's no reason to ban a particular breed of animal. I mean, certainly you can ban a dog with bad behavior. I, I think that's totally appropriate. But exactly. Not, I had not, a friend that had a yellow lab that would bite people. Oh, now, who yeah. would think of a yellow lab in that way? And he would bite people all the time. I mean, he lived out his life and they made sure that they were very, very re responsible. That's the thing. It's all about the pet owner. They wouldn't let him be in a dangerous situation for him or the person. But that's a lab. And I'm just saying, yeah. you know, and it's also where they came from. When I rescued Petey, he was tied to a tree in Harlem. He was used as a bait dog. And he was sick. He had triple pneumonia. He was 60 pounds when I got him. And fortunately, because of my relationship with the rescue, they allowed me to take him and get him well and not neuter him because normal laws with a rescue, you have to neuter. Well, they knew if they neutered him with triple pneumonia, he'd be dead. So we waited till he got better. And um, he ended up having a problem with anesthesia, as it turned out. But my point to your listeners is that I just don't want people to think all bully breeds are bad just because they look a certain way th that they're a bad dog, because it's, it, it's the reason they're being euthanized in droves and it breaks my heart. And the other important message about fostering, which I can proudly say I am not a foster fail now, I've done it uh, twice with these two dogs, because I knew that I have three pretty, you know, seniors, uh, strong, dominant males. And <clears throat> one of the dogs was a male and he was very sheepish and, and sweet, only two years old, but I knew my other male would not get along with him. So I knew right from the get go, I had two separate areas, two separate houses, we could work with them and keep them that I would never adopt them because it wouldn't work in my pack, my current pack. And I have to tell you, these dogs were so abused, scars on their back. The male couldn't walk because he was so afraid and, and abused. And the female, you know, they were terrified. They didn't know how to bark. They didn't know how to walk, how to, you know, they were afraid to eat. They became such loving mushes. We got, and I said to the foster group, you know, their goal is to get every dog home. I said, okay, I'm going to do this, but I'm telling you right now, these dogs must go together. And I said, I, I'm really going to stand up for this. I know you're responsible for them and it's your decision, but I've been living with them and taking care of them. And they only know the security and love of each other. And as much as they love us and they've come out of their shell, to split them up would be animal cruelty. And I said, I'm begging you. I don't care how long it takes. I'm keeping them. And it took two and a half months. You know, most fosters hang on to dogs two weeks, three weeks, a month, we, two and a half months. And we found the perfect home for them. And she loves them. And the joy of doing that was so unbelievable to me. It was very hard to say goodbye. I cried. But you know what? What am I saying goodbye to? I'm giving them a wonderful life to live on and for their, the rest of their life. And I tell people all the time that fosters are the bridge between hell and heaven because they've usually come out of such a horrific situation. We need to humanize them. They need to know that humans are good and kind and can be loving because they didn't know that these animals can come around when you give them love, when you teach them, it's okay. I feel a lot that way about raising kittens differently though, in that right. the kittens are raised not 
in a cage somewhere till they're old enough to be adopted. But they live in my house and they meet, you know, evil Mr. Vacuum Cleaner and the terrorizing paper shredder. And they know what the dishwasher sounds like. And they know what like normal family noises, people talking in the TV and the radio on and, and that. And they know people come and they go and lights go on and off. And so they grow up, you know, right under my feet. I'm stepping on them constantly you hear this little Aww. and but Aww. but then when they go to a forever family they know what it's like to be in a house as opposed to what it's like to be in a cage and the first the best ever kittens went to uh, someone that I work with partner's parents and she said I she took the cats the kittens to the partner's parents house opened up the cage and figured that the kittens would make a beeline under the sofa under the bed somewhere hiding nope the parents had bought out petco and had cat trees and cat toys and beds and the kids were like oh this is good and let's climb up the tree let's get in the bed let's do this and and where's lunch kind of thing and so if, <laughs> if kittens arrive in a household that's brand new and strange and don't run under the bed then i think i've done my job in in raising you've done god's kittens. work you know? This is what I'm saying, Anne. That's why w what you've done is amazing, because think about it this way. That's why fostering, I really think, is the most important job you can do. And anybody that does it right and becomes a foster fail is an angel, because you're getting them ready for their forever life. And do you know how many people, you know, I'm always encouraged, go to the shelter, go to the shelter. But sadly, when they get them right out of the shelter, like what we've seen, you with your kittens and me with these dogs that have been so abused, most people don't have the patience or the wherewithal to understand that it will change. It will get better. There will be a light at the end of the tunnel. And people need to understand if you've been abused your whole life and all of a sudden you're in a new home, you might be scared. You might have an accident. You might be, you know, um, gnawing on the sofa. But what the foster does is get them humanized, get them ready for their next life. And that's yeah. why what you've done, these kittens would be, you know, a whole different ballgame and might be dumped back in a shelter if it wasn't for Ann Hohen House. And that's what I'm trying to tell you, your listeners, if you can do it. And again, not everybody can do it. You have to have a facility, a home, a situation. Uh, I have friends that I've talked into, and I literally mean talked into becoming fosters to try it. They said it was the best education for their children. It taught their children about caring. It taught their children about a commitment and it being responsible for someone else's life. And it taught them most important about compassion and how to care and love something. And they said their children are better children because of fostering. And well, it's sad you know, when they have to go. When my go son graduated from high school and went away to college, the first set of kittens I had without him, I was dying because I'm like, who's going to go and pick up the supplies from the ASPCA and who's going to go with me to carry the kitten carrier and the cat and the cat food home. And so <laughs> And then, of course, my husband adores the kittens, and he teaches them to read the New York Times. He sits on the sofa. Oh, I and love then, it. <laughs> and then the kittens sit on his lap while he reads the paper. And you hear bash, bash, bash of the paper by little kitten hands. And then Aww. pretty soon you, you, you're like, where are the kittens? And then they're sleeping in his lap. And so it, it's really been a whole family, um, a whole family effort to to raise these kittens and so it's um it, it you're right it is not it, it's hard to be a one-person foster system so i want to i want to shift a little bit and talk about um your new line of pet products what what are they and who do they support Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, you know, um, I came out with this toy, Ruby. I don't know if you remember my Ruby. She, yes, we used to I, call think, her, uh, I think Ruby had a piece of Christmas tree up her nose, and didn't we have to pull that yes, out? Yes, yes, yes. And Ruby was my doxy. I was out in L.A. getting uh, a Genesis Award, one of my Genesis Awards, and my friend, who has sadly since passed away, said to me, we have to go to the shelter in Fulton, California, because there's a dog I have to look at for somebody. And I said, oh, great. Well, lo and behold, I go into the shelter 
the dog that he's looking at, I said, that dog doesn't look right. He looks very sick to me. I said, we got to get him out of here no matter what. Then next to him was this little doxy. You know, she was five years old at the time. They said five. I think she was more like seven. And she was on day 29. So day 29. Well, guess what, Ann? On day 30, they euthanize. If they're there 30 days, they're dead. I went and I asked someone to confirm that. I went, oh, my God. And she was clawing at me, like clawing at the cage. Like she was, it was God's way of telling me, take me, take me, take me. She was looking at me and like begging me. So we, we take her. We take the sick dog, and then next to the sick dog is his brother, beautiful white dog that looked in much better shape. Well, we take him too. That dog ended up with Brian Gumbel, who is now, the dog is now 12 and a half and doing amazing. I took Ruby. Sadly, dog, Brian's dog is Spencer. The other brother was named Earl, Earl Spencer, and uh. Earl only lives for four days and he was so sick but uh, again, it was the worst thing but I can take solace in knowing that at least we got him out and we got him vet care for the last four days of his life that he was at least being treated because he was in such horrible shape and Ruby went on to become what I called my sugar doggy she ended up selling every product of mine I've been on HSN and on QBC and what happened was I was at the Global Pet Expo getting an award and I took Ruby, and I didn't know this about her at the time. I'm walking by this one booth, and there was a shaking toy, and she went so crazy over it. Well, she wouldn't take it out of her mouth. So she walked all over the, the event with this thing in her mouth. I, I said, please let me buy it. Oh, no, 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 she's adorable. And I realized it was the sound mechanism. You know, it was the vibration. So I created along the same lines, this ball that goes inside of a huge stuffed bone shape. And my colors are orange and turquoise. And it says, Jill Rappaport, opt to adopt. And I created this ball. And with Christy Brinkley, we create, came up with all these crazy sounds that dogs like, like bird chirping, rabbits, dog barking, a cat meow, and, and like da, 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 all these sounds that get dogs' attentions. And we had it recorded. And then we put it in, it's called Shelter Shake. And so when the ball goes on, it vibrates and it vibrates. And why dogs love it so much is because they go crazy and they think, you know, their prey instinct, they jump on it, they bite it, they play at it, and then it stops. So you know, what does that mean, Anne? The dogs think that they've conquered it and or killed it, right? They said, oh, it stopped. Good. Then all of a sudden it starts jumping up in the air again. So it was such a huge hit. It sold out in thousands on uh, QBC, but because of Ruby. Ruby would go on the set with me, no matter what toy was in her mouth, if the host was holding another one, that was the toy she had to have. She was such a superstar. If your listeners go on QVC, Jill Rappaport, Shelter Shake, they will literally wet their pants watching Ruby. She sold everything for me. <laughs> so she was like, and, and, and I kept telling people, this is not a one dog wonder toy. And what I did to facilitate that, and so people knew it was such a great toy, I would go into local shelters and I would film me giving this toy to the scared, sick, whatever the animal was for the first time. We filmed immediate reaction. We filmed it. And all these dogs would come to life with Shelter Shake. It, and to this day, my friends, that ha it, it is it, truly animals love this toy. And I, why, by doing the tape, I proved that it's not just Ruby. And I said, you know what? She, you know, QVC is great, but I've already created this. And then with my leash company, they're born and made in the USA. They're in North Carolina. I created a whole line of 10 years ago. So they feel like silk. And all of the leashes sport sayings like opt to adopt. I'm a heart melter from a shelter. Bless you for my rescue. Be bold, go old. I have a whole senior line. And we've now come out with it in LD that comes with a charger. It has three speeds and you can see your dog. My little doxy, I have a lot of land here. When he's in the backyard, which is an acre, I can see the little twinkling lights. It's great for the city, you know, for traffic, for people. Um, and it just charges itself. And all of the sayings sport, you know, rescue sayings so that people know, and you know how they love bragging rights when you rescue, everybody likes to say they did it. And it goes back to helping animals in need. I tell each shelter, that if they're advertising it, they get a percentage of everything sold. And then I have a general, when they're sold generally on Shopify or through, you know, whatever people hear about it, then I donate to all the, I work with nine different shelters, you know, regularly, and I can give back to each and every one of them. 
but I'm very proud of it because it's, you know, a line that really tells people the right thing to do. It's a, the best leash and collar and the toy, which we have a limited supply of, um, it has been proven to be like the most important thing in the dog's life. Uh, so well, I Jill said, Rappaport, you know we have to close, but I want to tell everyone to buy Shelter Shake and Jill's lighted leashes and collars to keep your dog safe. Jill Rappaport, thank you so much for joining me today on Ask Vet, and we got to get together sometime soon. Oh, Anne, I miss you, and I love you, and bless your heart for what you're doing, and you are by far one of the finest vets in the world, and I'm honored to know you. I mean that. Uh, thank you so much. Now, for our listeners, if you have a question about your pet's health, just email me, and I'll answer your question on next month's Ask the Vet program. The email address is askthevet at amcny.org. We're going to take a short break. But we'll be right back with animal news stories. So I hope you'll stay right where you are and tune back in. We're back with Dr. Ann Hohenhaus on Ask the Vet. Hello and welcome back to Ask the Vet. It's time for the animal news. It's time for animal headlines. The biggest animal news from across the world. We've got lots of animal news for you today. First story up is about a pet emu, but not the lemu emu that we see on TV all the time. This pet emu leaped from her six foot fenced in pen in East Bridgewater, Massachusetts, and ran all the way to Brockton, a neighboring town. This resulted in a three hour long police chase of the emu who is named Mallory. So emus can run about 35 miles per hour, according to the emu's owner, Lee Flaherty. And he suspects that a wild animal may have scared Mallory and made her jump over the fence. Mallory was terrified. Can you imagine a loose emu in Brockton, Massachusetts, crossing intersections and running next to cars? Can you imagine being in a car with an emu? It's by you. I mean, the whole idea of this thing is just crazy. And finally, a bystander caught Mallory in a shopping center parking lot. So Mallory is now back in her pen with her companion, Mickey. And I hope that instead of a six foot high fenced in yard, eight or 10 at this point. Um, amazing to watch these videos on Google. Just Google Mallory the Emu if you want to see the amazing story uh, up close and personal. Our second story is a 30 year old dog from Portugal who was declared the oldest dog ever by the Guinness Book of World Records. This dog is a Rafiero do Aliento, which is a Portuguese livestock dog. Kind of looks to me, uh, if, if you Google it, it kind of looks like a riff on a St. Bernard, 100-125 pound dog. This dog named Bobby was born on May 11th, 1992. And the owner, Lionel, who was just eight when Bobby was born, describes his dog as one of a kind. His family believes the secret to Bobby's longevity is that he grew up in the countryside in a calm and peaceful environment, surrounded by nature. The family describes Bobby as being a very calm dog, sociable, who loves all their other pets, especially the four feline siblings, and will walk around the farm and hang out under the pine trees. I'm not sure that I would vote for this personally, because I think that dog food is the best food for dogs. But Bobby eats the same meal as his dog owners do every day. Can you imagine how big a plate of food a dog needs if it's a 120 pound dog of your food? Um, and that the food he eats is unseasoned and dog friendly, but I I'm always worried about poor nutrition when we try and decide to feed our dogs people food. The previous holder for the Guinness Book of World Records oldest dog ever was back in 1939, who was Bluey, an Australian cattle dog who lived 29 years and five months. So Google Bobby, B-O-B-I, in the Guinness Book of World Records oldest dog ever. Our third story is a water animal. A kayaker was hoping to encounter a beluga whale during his ride and got more than he bargained for. 
personally, if I was going to count a beluga whale, I would just go to the aquarium in Coney Island. They have really nice beluga whales there. And I don't know that I would want to meet one in a wetsuit, but that's exactly what this kayaker did. He took his kayak out, singing at the top of his lungs, and when a small pod of whales uh, began to interact with his kayak, he put on a scuba mask and started to dive and swim near the animals while singing. In the most incredible interspecies duet, the beluga whales actually began to sing back to him with their chirps and trills. This is a must-see video. Just Google kayaker and singing whales. Now, my fourth story is my personal favorite, partly because it's local and partly because I really like birds. So here in New York City, somebody was not thinking and cut the steel meshing of a majestic Eurasian eagle owl in the Central Park Zoo. And Flaco, who's a 14-year-old, uh, Eurasian eagle owl went out through the hole and was living his best life in Central Park. People really worried about Flaco because he's been a captive owl and uh, Twitter appropriately was a flutter with sightings of Flaco here there. And on Twitter, there's a hashtag called free Flaco as well as an online petition to keep Flaco free. But people, of course, were worried that Flaco wouldn't be able to get dinner because he was used to have dinner served as opposed to making his own. But shortly after he uh, was free in Central Park, people noticed, and there are actually videos on Twitter, the hashtag about Flaco on Twitter is Flaco, F-L-A-C-O underscore the owl, one word. And you will be able to find the video of Flaco barfing up an owl pellet which contained a rat skull in it. So Flaco has regained his ability to become a pro at feeding on the Central Park bounty of rats that we have. And so the zoo officials have now announced that they are not going to try and capture Flaco, but they're going to monitor him carefully. And if his health deteriorates in any way, then they'll work harder to capture him. But Twitter is completely full of beautiful photos of this owl who's golden brown and got great ear tufts. So I think that uh, you really should at least look at the pictures. Um, and I, when I have some free time, am going to head out and look for Flaco myself. Now, one of the most common reasons for an animal to visit the ER is when a pet is having difficulty urinating. So if your dog or cat is having trouble urinating, it's important to watch them carefully for clues to the problem because you need to take them to the veterinarian and you need to explain exactly what you see. Is the pet trying to urinate but not going? Is it urinating very frequently with blood? Or perhaps is it urinating and making a huge amount of urine? All those details are really, really important. You can learn more about this important health issue from a recent blog called My Pet is Trying to Urinate and Nothing is Coming Out. What is wrong? You can just go to AMC's website, which is www.amcny.org, and in the search bar, put difficulty urinating. And now for my favorite part of the show, our listeners' questions. And our first question comes from someone in Kansas City. This is from Anne. Anne in Kansas City says, why would my vet give my cat the FVRCCP vaccination instead of the FVRCP? My cat has been very sick ever since her vaccination, will not eat or drink for over a week. Help. So I, I'll, I'll come back to the vaccinations themselves, but if your cat is not eating or drinking for a week, it's time for a trip back to the veterinarian. I can't really speak for why a veterinarian would, why it, this veterinarian chose the FBR CCP vaccine over the, the more traditional FBR CP vaccine. But let me translate a little bit. FBR CCP stands for feline viral rhinotracheitis, calicivirus, chlamydia, and panleukopenia. 
And the FVRCP vaccine does not have the chlamydia component. So one might speculate that that veterinarian in Kansas City is seeing more cats with chlamydia and is trying to protect this particular cat. But a week of not eating or not drinking after a vaccination is totally abnormal. And so this poor cat needs to go back to the veterinarian. And I hope your kitty is feeling better much sooner um, and that everything turns out okay. Our next emailer is from Portland, Maine. Yes, Madeline. And Madeline has my rescue dog has had a severe break near the base of his tail for at least three years. The rescue organization said it has already healed, whereas I want it amputated. I worry that he cannot express his emotions, plus occasionally it gets caught on things. Can you please help me make the right decision? So I, it's really interesting that amputation comes up again in this particular podcast, because in the segment with my friend Jill Rappaport, we talked about her dog whose leg was amputated and this week's AMC blog on amputation. Um, tail amputation was, I think, the number one blog that I wrote in 2022. And so you can go to amcny.org and put tail amputation in, and you can hear what I think about tail amputations in pets. My question to this client, because I really can't answer her question, is, is the rescue pet painful? If the tail is painful, then yes, you want to make your pet pain free. But if the tail is not painful, and the tail is otherwise healthy, I don't see a reason that it needs to be amputated, um, except for a painful condition. And so it's really hard for people. This, this uh, emailer has really hit the nail on the head that people are worried their pet can't express its emotions uh, without a tail. So pain, amputate, no pain, don't amputate. Hope that turns out uh, well for you and your pet. And our last call for today is from Denver, Colorado. And Don from Denver writes, we have a six-year-old Calavir King Charles who just loves to eat grass. Could there be some deficiency in her diet or perhaps is there a behavioral issue? Either way, can you please give me advice? So this, there is a disorder in animals called pica, which means that you eat non-food items. So this is, grass is really sort of a food item if, if you're a cow, um, but a lot of dogs eating grass causes them to vomit. So if the six-year-old Cavalier King Charles Spaniel is vomiting up the grass, then I think it's not a good thing to let the dog eat grass. If it eats it and doesn't vomit, I don't think that that eating it is a problem. However, I think that if the dog is eating a lot of grass, they should look at the food, the can or the box or the bag that they're feeding their dog and make sure that that food contains the American Association of Feed Control Officials statement. And what that statement will say is something like, this diet is complete and balanced for six-year-old dogs or adult dogs. And if it says that, then your pet food does not probably have a deficiency in it and everything should be okay. The dog just likes a, a green vegetable every now and then. However, if the food does not have a statement that sounds like what I just recited, then I think you need to see your veterinarian and talk about a different food. So I hope that uh, that helps Dawn from Denver uh, with her Cavalier. Now I'd like to share a little bit of important health information for dog parents. Canine flu is on the rise in certain parts of the country, most recently in Philadelphia. New York City isn't currently having a spike in cases, but I think it's helpful for our listeners to understand how flu is spread so that you can figure out if, in fact, your pet Need, your dog needs a flu vaccine. Flu in dogs is spread exactly like it is in people coughing, sneezing, uh, maybe a dog who sneezes on something and then the next dog comes along and touches that bowl or toy. Flu is not seasonal in dogs. So although we have a fall flu shot to protect us, canine flu circulates year round. So you might want to consider a flu vaccine if your dog is likely to be in touch with other dogs. 
And now we're going to take a little break. And when we come back, we'll have news from the USDAN Institute. We're back with Dr. Ann Hohenhaus on Ask the Vet. Hi, we're going to have the news now from AMC's USDAN Institute for Animal Health Education. There is a brand new pet health event coming up on Wednesday, March 15th, 6 p.m. Eastern Time on Zoom. That will be the live performance of this presentation, but it will be archived on amcny.org if you miss the March 15th, 6 p.m. Zoom. Our cardiologist, Dr. Carl Toborowski, who's a senior veterinarian and specialist in cardiology at AMC, will discuss some of the common congenital heart diseases in dogs and cats. That will be diseases that dogs and cats are born with of their heart, not diseases that are acquired over their lifetime. And he's going to talk also about how they diagnose these how cardiologists treat these diseases, and what their long-term prognosis is. As usual, registration for this event is free and required so that you can get the Zoom link. So if you go to www.amcny.org backslash USDAN events, you can register for this event or find the recording if you were listening to this podcast after March 15th. I want to thank my very special guest, Jill Rappaport, and a big shout out to everyone who's downloaded the Ask the Vet podcast. We really appreciate your support. Remember, you can email us at askthevet at amcny.org, and I will answer your question on next month's show. Don't forget to check us out on social media, facebook.com, The Animal Medical Center, twitter.com, amcny. Instagram AMCNY. I'll be back next month with our next installment of Ask the Vet. Have a great month, everyone.